So, right. Um, let's get cracking then. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, essentially what I've been working on the last few years and what I'd really like to get uh, more and more people involved in. So, so Idris 2 is my, uh, my, my pet language. This is my, uh, my take on functional programming with dependent types. Um, I'm having lots of fun with it. I'm particularly having fun, uh, a lot of fun with Idris 2 now because finally I get to use uh, Idris for a project that I care about. That is Idris itself. So you know, if you if you make a programming language, then um, you kind of want to do something um, something worthwhile with it. Turns out, all I really know how to do is implement programming languages. So I thought, hey, let's see if we can implement Idris in itself. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, so what is Idris? I'm kind of assuming that um, uh, I'm kind of assuming things about the audience here. So I'm generally assuming. Um, a lot of you will be uh, grad students, some of you will be maybe uh, industrial developers who are looking to, to learn a little bit more about, uh, about what's going on in, in language design in academia at the moment. But just as a I was gonna say show of hands, just as a, as a ping of hands, uh, has anyone done much Idris programming? So if you've, if you've done a little bit, please, um, let's, I'm, I'm just gonna try to judge how, med, how much pinging is happening. Okay. <laughs> this that's that's um I over over time I'll I'll get an impression of how many pings is a lot and how many pings is not many. This 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 sounds like a lot of pings. Right, okay, so there there are quite a few people who've done a bit of Idris programming. Um so I'm gonna tell you a bit about um the internals of Idris. I'm gonna show you a little bit about how it works, a little bit about uh how you might contribute to it in the end. And and in some ways, this is about um, teaching you to be able to contribute, but in a lot of ways, it's just about uh, kind of advanced programming with dependent types. So learning a few techniques that you might not know about uh, and maybe going off to, to work on your own systems. So I know a lot of you will be uh, <clears throat> doing your own experiments in uh, um, in, in programming language design. Yeah, so a lot of you will be doing your own experiments in, in language design and um, uh, hopefully, this will give you some ideas about uh, how you might go about doing those uh, bits of implementation. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction to Idris, or at least the bits of Idris that are going to be important for implementing Idris. So, some of the things I found most useful. And we're going to spend most of the time implementing uh, a little language that, uh, for the want of a better name, uh, I've chosen to call Tiny Idris, which is. Um, uh, a scaled down version of Idris that just has the important core features. So it uh, doesn't have much useful high level syntax. It does have um, type checking, it does have evaluation and a little bit of unification. Uh, when I say it's scaled down, it's meant to be cut down. <clears throat> so what I mean is I literally did take the full Idris 2 and uh, I took the core and chopped out the bits that uh, that were not going to be important. I've, I've even tried to add a, a, an extra comment or two here and there. So what that does mean is that if you have, if you found your way around um, tiny address, if you if you're able to implement some of the features, then there is a direct mapping to what's going on in the real system. So if you um, uh, if you can uh, figure out what's going on there, you'll uh, you'll work out what's going on um, in address itself. Uh, so one other thing, if you didn't see on the Slack, uh, I'm putting the materials for this course up on GitHub. So all of the code that I'm uh, going to work through uh, is up there. And uh, and these slides are on, on GitHub. So you'll get, I'll, I'll put the slides up in advance. I, I see no reason to uh, uh, to keep the things in the slides a secret. So if you, want to, um, if you do want to look at the slides ahead of the lectures, um, then that is something you can do. Just as adva uh, advanced warning, don't expect the slides too far in advance of the lectures because it's possible I won't have prepared them too far in advance of the lectures, but they will be up there uh, in advance. Right, so um, so what we're going to do, you're, you will hopefully by the end of this, my, or my, my goal for you is that um, you will have uh, some understanding of 
the, the essence of, of, of dependently typed languages, so how they work. So the primary um, uh, things that you need to implement in order to have a dependently typed language working. So I'll show you type checking, I'll show you how type checking works. I'll show you how elaboration works. So the distinction between type checking and elaboration, by the way, at least uh, as, as I look at it, uh, type checking is where you have um, so in, in the Idris sense, at least, is you have the, the core representation, it's completely explicit, and we will check that the, um, that the completely explicit core representation is well typed um, by the type that you've claimed that it has. Elaboration is um, a, a higher level step. So it's where you take something that is more like what a, a human would write, more like the, the user level code, and as it were, elaborate it, embellish it. So put all of the um, put all of the all of the concrete, precise type information that is needed in order for the machine uh, to type check it. So what uh, what Idris two does is it'll take your your high level uh, Idris program, go through a few steps of elaboration. It will eventually end up at the core representation, and at that point we have a very small core language. It is then possible to feed that again to a type checker that's just not very clever at all and it just knows about the core typing rules and it can ensure that what is produced as a process of elaboration is uh, is valid so it's um an additional um uh, validation step on on the the result of elaboration so the distinction between elaboration and type checking elaboration um fills in all of the details that you have left implicit type checking is checking the completely explicit um representation so, um, so you'll understand how the core representation works. And I'm going to spend quite a lot of time on the core representation, basically because if you understand the core representation, everything else is, um, I'm not going to say plain sailing, but it's um, uh, everything follows from the core representation. And in fact, if there's anything, I, if, if, if there's one thing I've learned about dependently type programming from this process of um, implementing Idris in itself, is that it's that, um, you don't actually need to use dependent types an awful lot. You don't need to. You don't need a lot of dependent types in your system to get a huge amount of benefit. So I spent um, when first working on Idris two, I spent an awful lot of time just working out what the core representation should be, kind of trying more things in the type versus less things in the type. So uh, if I have too many things in the type, the machine starts to get in the way. If I don't have enough in the type, then the machine isn't helpful enough. So I spent quite a long time figuring out what that representation was to get the right amount of help from the machine without the machine getting in the way. And we'll see a little bit of the story of um, how I got there and what we ended up with here. Yeah. So, but everything is followed from that. A lot of the decisions I've had to make as a, uh, later on have been following on from what the core representation is. Um, so you'll learn how to implement uh, some of the useful components of a complete dependently typed language. It will be a small dependently typed language, so it won't be something that you would uh, expect to be able to use for day-to-day -day work, but it's something that, um, that you could use uh, as the basis of your own project. And uh, in fact, um, so a lot of you will be um, grad students, I, I, I'm assuming, or I've, I've seen from um, uh, the list of people who are here. And um, I'll tell you something that, that basically how my, uh, how my PhD went was, um, you know, uh, sitting, uh, sitting at my desk, not really knowing what was going on, not really understanding very much. And um, Colin McBride and James McKinna uh, basically uh, sitting me down in front of a, a blank Haskell buffer and uh, and making me write a tiny type checker for uh, a dependently typed language. And as soon as I had that, it was like, well, this 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 is too hard to use. How do I make it easier to use? So how do I how do I implement tactics on top of that to turn it into a a bigger and more useful uh, language that I can actually do uh, some research around? So. One thing that one of my goals here is to get you to a, a place where you could be able to do the same thing as I did, taking a complete but small language, taking some aspect of um, language design or dependently pro type programming that you happen to be interested in. Let's say hypothetically you're interested in type driven program synthesis. So I picked that because that's what I'm interested in at the moment. Um, you can do a lot better. Or you can you'll have a lot more success 
uh, I think in the short term, working with a very small core language of the like of which we're going to work with over the next few days, um, than if you try to do it in the in, in the context of the full Idris system or the full Angular system or Coq or whatever system that you happen to pick. So you can use this um, as the of your own project. I'm totally happy for you to do that. Steal my code, um, do something interesting with it. And uh, of course, the <laughs> the real reason is that. Um, I need help on Idris too. So the more you know about how the core works, the the more I can get other people, uh, more, more we can have other people uh, than me dealing with some of the issues that come up with the core um, and, and 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 contributing to the system. So I put a link on this slide. Um, I as I've been writing it, I've written some uh, kind of sketchy notes, just outlining some of the decisions I've made, how some of the higher level features work. So by the end of this course, you'll be able to read that document and it will be able to teach you the bits that I haven't been able to cover here. Now, there is a lot of Idris too. Um, I can't promise to cover all of it because we only have uh, four lectures. So um, just in case some of these things are things that you were hoping uh, for me to talk about, these other things I'm not going to talk about. So I'm not going to talk about how quantities are implemented. Um, uh, I won't talk about how some of the higher level features get translated down to like the, the really high level features like uh, case blocks and with expressions and, and, and where clauses. Oh, we're just going to look at, uh, at core features. I'm not going to talk about parsing for two reasons. Firstly, I've written here, it's completely conventional. Um, it's, so there's, there's, there's nothing really new about parsing in Idris that uh, you haven't learned from elsewhere. Um, not only that, um, Parsing in Idris is actually one of the bottlenecks in performance, which is a little bit embarrassing given that uh, parsing is something that should be well understood. So we're not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about code generation because um, I don't like using the word straightforward, but it is relatively straightforward compared to uh, everything else we'd be doing. And again, fairly conventional. Well, it doesn't mean I don't want to talk about them. I'm quite happy to talk about them. Um, so please do ask me about uh, other things, especially after you've learned a little bit about the core and you're thinking, how does some feature fit in? Please do ask me about them. Uh, good times to ask would be, I guess we could we could chat informally over the um, um, over video after the lectures. We could chat on the SPLV uh, Slack uh, and we can talk in, in various other places. But I'm going to claim that you know, once you understand the core, these other features are easier to pick up. Um, we have a question. Marvelous. Well, I'm just about to suggest the question protocol, but um, what do we have? Yeah, I, I, I have to scroll up a bit, so please just read. If you could read out the question, because I can't see it. Philip, do you want to unmute yourself? I, I have no idea which question you're referring to. So. Okay, so the question is, where should we look up ways to do case? Ah, Chosen because it's less obvious. Right. Case is um, case is a very interesting example, and I think I could do an entire lecture or more on case. Um, I'm going to say ask me afterwards um, because that's probably the answer to the question, quite honestly. Um, uh, case is case is really quite tricky because um, because uh, dependent case is already tricky and then you start adding quantities and things get trickier still. So um, uh, so, so yeah, I, I'm going to brush that question off slightly, I'm afraid. But please please do ask me afterwards. Uh, one thing I suggest for asking questions, um, I'm I'm seeing lots of things go by and I'm not really noticing questions. Um, so I suggest what you do is ask in the chat, and and um, if there is something I've missed, probably probably OHAG will need to prod me. Um, so don't worry about appearing. Normally when it when it's an in person an in person thing, I normally suggest that um, if you have a question and you're worried that it's a silly question, just nudge the person next to you and say, you know. Do you understand what Edwin's on about? Um, you don't quite have a person next to you at the minute, but uh, you know, please ask in the chat. And um, you know, I'm not going to read out any names. Uh, if I do, maybe <laughs> I hope I don't read out any names by accident anyway. So don't worry about appearing on the recording. Um, but also ask questions, not just in the lecture, but outside the lecture. What I'll try to do is any questions that I've missed during the lecture, I'll try to summarize them at the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, particularly if there's a few things uh, coming up quite often. But probably the right thing to do is ask in the chat 
and I will wait for OHAD to, to prod me. Um, unless I figure out a way of um, setting up my what's in my line of sight, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to catch the questions, I'm afraid. Right, so today uh, we'll have an Idris overview. I'll talk about the core features. I'll show you tiny Idris. I've got some warm-up exercises, so I don't, I'm not going to have you just sitting there listening uh, to me rabbiting on. Uh, I've got some exercises for you to um, just to try out. Today, uh, they're just designed to um, uh, get you doing a little bit of Idris programming if you're a bit rusty on it, and they are things that will come up inside the system itself. So. Um, so even if you think you know how to do them, do them anyway. If you do know how to do them, you, you'll get through them relatively quickly. If you don't know how to do them, you'll have learned something. So everyone's a winner. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to talk more about the core language. So today, I'm, I'm going to like overview the system, uh, the, 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 uh, just a, a kind of a bird's eye view of what's going to happen. Tomorrow, we'll get into the core language. We'll learn the most important thing, which I think if you've been following the, um, the summer school throughout, You'll have learned a lot about this already. So how to deal with variable names. So you'll already know um, that that is hard. You'll know why it's hard, and you'll know a little about how to deal with it. So I'll sh I'll show you Idris's take on it, and this is uh, like the Idris two implementation's take on it. And this is the place where we really use uh, dependent types the most of all in in the Idris implementation is dealing with variable names. So guaranteed, an Idris uh, the implementation of Idris will not um, have ill-scoped programs um, so because that's the one thing that we care about in the term representation. So we'll do a few manipulations on that. We'll do some of the, the important things that you'll need to be able to do to write any kind of operations on it, so weakening, contraction, substitution. So these things come up over and over again. Uh, then we'll get to type checking and evaluation. So I've put these two things together because um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of an awkward chicken and egg problem in, in a dependently typed language. In that, if you look at the um, typing rules, uh, you'll see that the typing rules depend to some extent on evaluation, and you can't evaluate something that hasn't been type checked. So we'll see how these things fit together. We'll see how um, we'll see how we, we represent normal forms as opposed to just um, uh, syntactic uh, uh, representations of terms. We'll see how type checking dependent types work. So I'll show you the typing rules and I'll show you how that uh, corresponds to the code. And then we'll see the crucial part of um, where evaluation fits into type checking, which is the conversion check. So essentially. Um, you know, the, 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 the high level view of type checking dependent types is you'll synthesize a type for a term. You have a type that is expected. You check that they both those, both of those things evaluate to the same normal form. Um, so a little bit more complicated than that. If you just do that, um, then it's potentially quite slow. By the way, that's what Idris one did. It's one of the reasons it was a little bit slow. Um, so, uh, but you'll see how that works in a, in a more efficient way uh, in Idris 2. And then finally, um, uh, the thing that really takes something from being a, um, just an implementation of the type theory into something that is plausibly a, a programming language that uh, the humans might want to program in, uh, we'll add unification. So we'll see how to introduce implicit syntax, and we'll basically use all of what's come before. We'll use all of the kind of representations of normal forms. We'll 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 do normalization where appropriate. We'll do um, all of the manipulations on terms as we go through um, unification. Um, a lot of the time, I'm just going to leave gaps in the code, so I'm not going to show you complete implementations. Um, the complete imp implementation is available, so as a kind of a reference. Um, but I would highly encourage you to work through those implementations yourselves and check that you're able to do it. Right, so I'm going to show you, um, yeah, so I'm going to show you a bit of um, type-driven development, as I like to call it. So, you know, times first, uh, and then we'll synthesize, or we'll kind of derive a program from the type, or we'll refine a, a program from the type. And um, I'm not going to start at the beginning, because like I say, uh, we, we had a ping of hands earlier, and I kind of got the impression that quite a lot of you know a bit about Idris already. Um, so I'm just going to show you some of the things that are new in Idris 2, both to um, give you an impression of what we have to contend with when we're implementing it, but also to give you an idea of what's available 
while you're working on it. So one of the nice things about having a you know implementing a language in itself is that firstly you get to use it, but also if you think if you think a feature would be useful, you get to add it, and then you get to use it. So so we'll see we'll see how these features um, are important for uh, for working with uh, with Idris too. So. Um, so hopefully you can um, you can see some code now. Um, please somebody tell me if you can see some code because I doubt my ability to use computers. Good, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, what you see here is um, uh, so I'm, sh I'm showing you quantities here. So quantitative type theory. We're not gonna we're not gonna use linearity. Uh, so we got well, there are three quantities that that we care about in Idris programs. There's there's zero, one, and unrestricted. Um, we're not gonna use one um, beyond this this introductory example, but we are certainly going to worry about uh, zero. So we're certainly gonna worry about things that are erased. So remember, every variable uh, in an Idris two program uh, has a quantity. It tells you how many times uh, that variable is going to be used at runtime. So we're either going to use the variable zero times, meaning that we can erase it, so it doesn't exist at runtime at all. Uh, we could use it exactly once, meaning that we can do fun things with protocol design. It's not out, it's that sort of out, out of the scope of this um, course, but thing you can do. Uh, and then there's unrestricted. So unrestricted is what you typically have. It's what you have in, in Idris 1. Everything is, by default, unrestricted use. And then Idris 1 did some uh, compile time analysis um, to, to decide what to erase. Idris 2 does that in the types. So that turns out to be a really valuable thing because it means we know what is available at runtime and what isn't. Like we know what, how the compiler is going to behave. We don't have to guess how it's going to behave. We don't have to kind of prod it in the right direction to get to, to, to erase the things that we needed to. We just tell it. Anyway, so, so how quantities work is um, you, you, you can in a type signature, you can put a quantity uh, in, um, in in the argument type. Um, so here, uh, first, so just a spoiler, we're not going to be able to write this function. So this is a this is a function that says it will use x exactly once. X has type tie, so some polymorphic type, and it's turn uh, a pair of of, of tie. Um, so even though we're not going to be able to write it, I'm going to blunder on just to show you how this works in practice. So, so I'll, I'll make a, a candidate definition or a skeleton definition. We can look at the, we can look at holes. This is just like an Idris one. So the interactive editing, if you've, if you've worked with Idris one, then at least in theory, the interactive editing should work to some extent in, um, in Emacs and Atom. It definitely works in Vim. I'm using Vim here. I think it works to some extent in VS Code earlier uh, as well. I heard a, um, oh, uh, oh, I says no. <laughs> I would say right. That's nice to have question. Um, uh, so um, yeah, so it. it uh, I just saw the highlights of no. That was all. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess it works to something in VS Code as well. So uh, there might, if, if there's any teething problems with that, we can figure that out on on, on Slack. But I, I'm using Vim because it's just what I use. Um, so if we check the type of a hole, we see like in Idris 1, you would see the types of things, that the names and the types of things. Idris 2 also gives you the quantity. So, so crucially, this, this tie has a zero next to it, which means that we are not allowed to use that type uh, at runtime. So it's not available at runtime. We can talk about it now. It's, it's relevant to um, the type checking of the, uh, of the expression, but it's erased at runtime. And then the one next to the X means that X has to be used exactly once. So I can try writing this program. I can partially write it. Uh, we'll see that uh, now, now we've consumed X. We're not allowed to use it again. So there's zero X is available again. We can talk about it. It's relevant to the type checking, but it's not something we can use. So if I blunder on and, and, and try to use it, then it says, no, you can't do that. There's, there's two uses of linear name X. Um, yeah, so the, the, the important thing there is not so much the, the linearity, but the fact that, that we have quantities, we have we have things available at runtime and things that are only available at compile time. So as one um, very simple example of this would be the identity function. So if I, if I try to write this function for all a, a to a, so writing my id here, I'm not allowed to uh, inspect a. Um, and it's a good thing that I'm not allowed to uh, inspect A, given that this is the identity function, because if I was allowed to inspect A, 
you know, if I tried doing something like, well, if it's an if it's an int, I'm actually going to increment it. Um, that's not that's not the identity function anymore, and it says no, you can't do that. You can't match on the int because it's an erased argument. On the other hand, if I don't if it uh, so if I don't give a quantity, um, then then it's assumed to be something that's available at runtime, and we don't have this this arbitrary coincidence. Uh, distinction between types and values. So the only the only distinction between types and values is that values are left of the colon, types are right of the colon. There is absolutely no reason why I shouldn't be allowed to inspect a type at runtime if that's a useful thing for my program. Yes, I don't get the I don't get any the properties of you know parametricity of that type, but I haven't said I want them. I haven't said that this. This this knotted this not identity function there's a, there's a clue it's not going to be the the identity function I I haven't said that this is um, parametric in the type um, so it doesn't have to be so um, so I could try writing this and I could I could write the same thing um, but now if I say that a is an int um, then it's fine to increment it so. So people worry about parametricity at this point quite often. Uh, I'm going to say, um, don't worry about it, because parametricity is not about being parametric in types. It's just coincidentally that it's it's always types in the interesting examples that you've probably seen. Um, it's about, so parametricity is about parameters. It's not about types, you know, as the name says. Things that are not types could also be parameters. So um, we could have something that is parametric in a NAT, for example. Um, I you know, can't come up with a, uh, a useful example of that off the top of my head. But um, uh, anyway, that's the important distinction is it's about whether it's available at runtime or not. So my id, it's not available at runtime, not id, it is available at runtime. So again, I spent some time on this because this is going to be uh, this is going to be crucial to us throughout um, when we're when we're implementing Idris two because we are going to have some dependent types. So, so we're going to have terms depending on names in particular, and whether those names that we're depending on are available at runtime is something that we're going to have to think about. Right, the name we probably do want the names available at runtime because we want to display error messages, for example. But there might be cases where we don't need the names available at runtime, um, so we can explicitly um, make that distinction. Anyway, having quantities and types allows us to make that uh, distinction between what's there at runtime and what isn't. I've got another little example that um, that, that illustrates that. Th this is my new favorite um, introductory. Um, dependently type programming example because because it captures so many of the interesting things that come up, particularly thinking about quantities and erasure uh, in, in a very small uh, and a very small number of lines of code. And it also illustrates something else I think which is important, which is when people start writing, um, in, when people start learning about dependent types, uh, a, a common Beginner, uh, I'm not going to say mistake. I'm going to, um, I'm going to say common beginner. What's the word? Um, <laughs> pattern maybe uh, is to try to put everything in the type. So, so try to have the type capture every possible property uh, of the program. And what always happens uh, is you end up, um, you end up running into trouble because you put things in the type that are really hard to explain. Uh, as part of the program, and they're not really helping you anymore. So, so you maybe you're, you know, you, if you try expressing that uh, sort, um, sorting gives you an ordered permutation of the input. Well, it's not tremendously useful um, in general to write a, a sort program uh, that, that that explicitly has that property verified. Like you might be working in a context where it's absolutely vital that that, that property is verified, but in general, um, it's not a property that you're interested in for working with the rest of your program. Um, so the reason I say it's not a mistake is you, you, you learn an awful lot by trying to do that, but you don't um, necessarily um, you, you don't necessarily achieve writing the program. So this example is uh, run length encoding, and it shows how you can use one data type to describe the properties uh, of another data type. So a run length thing, like run length encoding, if you're not familiar with it, is, is where you, you can you can compress. Uh, lists where you have uh, runs of the same element. So you'd say, I have, oh, so in this example, I have three X's followed by four Y's. 
Uh, so if you have a lot of um, lot of runs of that form, you can uh, you can compress uh, you can compress that data. So it was used in um, uh, painting programs in the certainly in the 90s when when you, you've got large blocks of the same color, you can just say, oh, I have I have 200 pixels that are blue here. Um, so this data type um, expresses the run length and coding of a list. Uh, notice that it doesn't give the most precise description of a run length and coding of a list uh, for two reasons. Firstly, I'm allowed to have runs of, of zero things, which so, so repeating zero Xs, um, that's not tremendously useful. That's actually made the list bigger rather than smaller. Um, and it, we might also, uh, this, this could also say we have 1x followed by 1x followed by 1x, which would be better represented as 3x. So it's not guaranteed to, to be the best possible encoding, but it is guaranteed to be an encoding. So we're looking for something that, uh, that, that, um, that, that kind of expresses the meaning of the data without necessarily forcing us to think about what is the best possible uh, representation of that data. Uh, so I haven't said what rep is. And uh, I'm actually defined rep, and I, I partly do this to to show off a new thing that I've just added. So I'm I, I'm having I'm having enormous fun with with type driven program synthesis. So if I ask it to generate a definition of this based on the type, then the first thing it's up with is actually the thing I was looking for. Um, slightly surprised by this, to be honest. Um, but the reason it, it's the first, the reason it comes up with that one is that there is a heuristic that it will it will generate a number of candidate definitions, and then it will sort them according to um, uses of bound variables. And it happens that the first one it comes up with, with the, it, it tries to use every variable uh, once, but not too many times more than once. And it just happens that the first implementation it comes up with is is repeating um, the input n times. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to write the run length encoding uh, function. In fact, I, here's one I made earlier, just to just to show that it's possible. I, I don't want to go through the details of this. Um, let's check it. Type checks. Good. Um, but I will show you the um, decompress or the uncompress function, because that shows you erasure in 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 the uh, the crucial way so so if i try to, for example i'll i'll try i'll try generating a, a, um uh, the so there you go what, what what does it generate for uncompress this this is not the correct implementation of uncompress because you know we've, we've got n x's followed by y it hasn't actually repeated the x n times uh so this 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 certainly type checks but it's um uh, it doesn't know how to repeat the x n times i haven't i haven't given it that search hint. so there is something that you might wonder about here so i've got in the type um the, the compressed thing is is a run length encoded version of x's and the thing i want to return is just x's so I, I, the thing i the thing i give back has to be the same as as the the index of that data so uh, of that 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 uh, run length encoded data. So if you were writing this in Idris 1, you might be tempted to do something like, um, I'll call that comp rather than run length. You might be tempted to do something like this and just say, well, I've already, I already know what the list is. It's, it's in the type, so I'll return it. So I'm uh, just thinking of anyone guessing what's going to happen here. Um, so unfortunately, we can't do that. So we can't access X's. And it's it's something of a relief that we can't access the uncompressed data directly, because if we were carrying around the compressed data and the uncompressed data at the same time, well, we haven't really achieved anything. So we're just we're just working with the uh, we're working with the, the, the compressed data, but all the time we've got the compressed data there hanging around. And we can make that we'll just be completely clear about that. Um, so you'll see here that uh, the X's is something we can talk about, and crucially, we can reason about it. Which is going to be how we how we get out of this um, situation. So we can reason about it. We can guarantee that the risk of uncompressing the data is going to be whatever X's was. We just can't access X's directly. So this is again reason I go through this. I'm um, going through this in such detail. You're going to encounter this quite a bit when you're working through um, the core representation in Idris 2, you're going to see things that uh, that are not available that you think either should be available or you need to reconstruct. So you need to think about, uh, this, this gives you an additional thing to think about, is the data something that you want at runtime or not? 
So uh, there's a clue just above of, of how we're going to get out of this situation. Now, I'll delete all of that. What we're going to return is the singleton. So a singleton is, is just a, um, a data type that has exactly one value, so the thing in the type. So X is a thing we can talk about. It's a thing we can reason about, but it's not a thing we can have. But that does mean the fact that we can reason about it means that we can write a program that definitely produces the same as X's, but it's had to reconstruct it. And um, pleasingly, uh, search will just give us the program that we expect. I heard a ping. That means someone's hand is up. Yes. So my question is, is this a property of the definition of your run length data type, or is this a property of the type of uncompressed? This, this property being that you can't cheat and return the uncompressed string because you don't want it to be stored. So do you mean in this case specifically when I'm returning a list? Yes. Right, okay. So this is this is a property of, um, of the type theory. It's a, a, a property of the, the quantities. Yeah, no, um, sure. But, but, but what, no, but what I mean is that here in, in uncompressing the type of the uncompressed function, I guess x is well. It, it's it's a bit hard to see because it's just implicitly defined here. But if you if you write it out explicitly in the type signature, I assume you would put a zero quantity on it, right? So um, yeah, like that. Yes. Yes. So, but okay. So so but then. But the, I guess my real question is that if if this is something that's enforced by the type of uncompressed, that just kind of rubs me the wrong way because I would want run length to be such that any time I have a run length at hand, I know that that's all I have and I don't carry the list around. So it's, shouldn't that be something that is a property of the run length type definition? Um, well, the run length type definition um also doesn't it, it's only in its index it's not in its data so the the general uh, the general rule is going to be that if you don't write it down it's not in the program and you haven't written it down at any point inside run length um so it's it's not there but you you always want to be able to say to, to express the relationship between uh, bits of data and there's there is there is nothing in run length here that, that, that forces other bits of data to have uh, other quantities. It might be that it makes perfect sense in some setting for me to have the uncompressed data available at runtime. In fact, I have to, if I want to uncompress the data at all, I have to be able to have that uncompressed data somehow. So when I produce that singleton, so um, let's just go back to the, the definition that we want. So. So if we were to say that, that this X as being an index of run length means that I am never allowed to have that X's, we're not going to be able to write this program because we're not going to be able to have access to, to an X's. So at some point when we when we produce when we produce our result, we might be wanting to use that uncompressed result in some other function. It might be related to the run length theta. It might be that in fact we want to pass a zero quantity of that run length data to another function and have the uncompressed data. So we've got that, we've got that flexibility. So, so if you, it's so that the, the, the data, the, the information you get about quantities and usage is going to be in a function type. It's not going to be in a data type. That's just how the theory works. I mean, it's, this, that, there's all sorts of decisions that you could make about how you express the quantity. So do you put them on variables? Do you put them on the binders? Do you put them on the return type? Do you put them in all sorts of other places? Um, the decision that I've taken is uh, is to do what um, Bob Atkey and Connor McBride did in, in a very clever quantitative type theory, because that way um, they worked it out and I didn't have to. So um, I would say that um, uh, much like it to be developing new type theories is uh, is not one of my strengths. Um, so um, so yeah, that's that, uh, that, that's uh, the, the, the important um, the important thing to remember is that uh, if you don't if if you if you have an implicit um, type parameter, then you can understand it as being a zero quantity um, of that um, type parameter. Uh, I had another ping. 
Yeah, there's a question from the chat. Is there a reason why Idris doesn't allow the naming of constructors the same as the type, like in Haskell? Uh, yes, that's a great question um, because it's 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 kind of fundamental to to how the type theory works, and it, it's something that we're going to come up against um, when we look at the representation of contexts. So the answer is they all live in the same namespace. So if you don't have this distinction between uh, types and values as, as being in different worlds, then every every name that you introduce is going to be part of the same world. So uh, so you have to pick a different name because they just live in the same world. Um, it's, I guess, uh, to, to, to some extent, once, once you've implemented a bit of a language, you start to see where, where some of these decisions that might initially look a bit weird and a bit annoying, um, you might start to see where they come from. It's got to the point now for me when I'm programming in Haskell that I find it really odd when a when a, a constructor and a data type has the same name. I, I get a bit confused now you know, when I see that. Anyway, we better move on because otherwise we'll we'll not get to the interesting bit. Well, I mean, I hope this is an interesting bit, but we'll not get to the we'll not get to the most interesting bits. Um, so I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about um, the structure of of the Idris uh, implementation. And, uh, and tiny edges. Uh, there, there may well be lots more questions on this. I'm uh, quite happy to take them offline. Like I'll hang around a little bit after the after the lecture, and we can we can talk about them off the record if people are okay with that. Uh, right, Ooh, not that window. That window. Now then. Um, so now that you see some of the the core features, so Erasure. Um, how type-driven development works in the editor. Uh, we'll think a bit about how Idris 2 itself works. So just a bit of history. You know, I, I started on this because I wanted to have a bigger system uh, implemented in Idris just to show that it would scale. And the only thing I really knew how to do was a new language. And at the same time, uh, Idris was really starting to, to show so you know, kind of creak around the edges. If you tried to do anything of any scale at all, it was really showing that that it, it wasn't going to scale. So it needed some re-engineering. So just putting these things together, it seemed like a good time to try implementing Idris again. And um, you know, why why not try implementing it in, in Idris one? Because then we'll at least make Idris one good enough to make Idris two. Um, so we'll say more about um, the kinds of uh, the, the kinds of ways that uh, we're using. Uh, types uh, to, to make Idris 2 tomorrow and, and the rest of the week. Uh, so just a couple of things to mention. Firstly, it, it, uh, the, the compiler is rather different in, in Idris 2. So it, uh, if you've installed it, you'll notice that you need uh, either Shea Scheme or Racket. So Idris 1 compiled via C in a C runtime um, that, that I wrote because uh, there was a point where where I fancied myself as, as capable of writing a, a runtime system. It turns out if you want good performance, it's much better to take a runtime system that has been uh, worked on for decades by specialists. Um, and people are often surprised that, I, that I've picked Shea Scheme. Um, Shea Scheme is significantly faster than, than my uh, hacky C runtime. If you turn off runtime checking, so this is why people are surprised, they don't wish scheme is dynamically typed language. You can turn off all of the checks, all of the dynamic checks, or certainly, certainly the, the dynamic checks that are related to type checking, and, uh, and you gain quite a bit of performance. And, um, and it, 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 as, as a result, it, it, it's running quite a lot faster. So the performance is <laughs> I, kind of pleasingly, I sort of tested uh, building the Idris 2 and Idris 1 versus building Idris 2 in itself. And uh, it's actually more than an order of magnitude faster. It's um, so more than 10 times faster. So, so it's, it's no longer a, a problem if, if, if I need to change something in the guts of the system that everything depends on. Um, I, no longer, um, I no longer have to go and make a coffee. So, so this has massively reduced my caffeine consumption. It's, it's fantastic. So what's the structure? Um, You'll see if, if you look at the um, the code base of Idris 2, you'll see that it's divided into um, a kind of module hierarchy. So there's uh, that, that gives you an idea of uh, roughly what the phases are. So we've got the high level syntax. That's all the high level features like uh, interfaces, um, implementations, uh, the, the um, kind of where clauses, um, 
all of the all of the all of the things that you want to use to make programs sort of look nice, do notation, um, pattern matching binds, that sort of thing. Um, throughout, it's annotated with the source location, so that gives us half a chance of reporting error messages in the right way. So annotating the output of errors with where it actually came from. Um, so that deshuggers to so the, de the deshuggering step um, doesn't really do anything clever. It, it really is taking the high-level syntax and and turning it according to some um, relatively simple rules into an intermediate uh, representation uh, called TTIMP. So that's a, a type theory with implicit arguments. So that's still supporting um, some high-level features. But we've removed well, duration. We've removed interfaces, so interfaces have been uh, translated into um, uh, records plus um, plus functions that uh, lock up things from those records or build records. So it's still got case blocks. Um, all of the interactive editing support that um, that you'll use in your editor or, or at the REPL, that's all done at the TT imp level. So that means if you uh, if you decide you want to write a new front end, and by the way, this would be a fun thing for someone to do. So if you're looking for a, a mini project, it, it could be quite fun to write new front ends to Idris that translate down to TTIMP. Um, so people have fun writing back ends. I think there's no reason why people shouldn't have fun writing front ends too. So if you if you write a front end that translates down to TTIMP, um, then you get the interactive editing for that front end too. So um, just as an idea, if someone wants to go off and do that, I think that'll be rather fun. So TTIMP elaborates to uh, QTT, that's a core type theory with quantities. So TTIMP elaborates QTT, something that type checks. So in QTT, you only have data declarations and pattern matching definitions. That is it. Um, so you can declare data constructors, you can declare type constructors, you can declare function types, and you can give pattern matching definitions for, for, for function types. And everything there is completely explicit. It is something that in principle, you could write out in some uh, machine readable form, you could give to an independent type checker, and then you could you could have that independent type checker ensure that um, it's a well-typed Idris program. And if we're worrying about um, safety and correctness, it might be that you say, well, I don't I don't completely trust Idris as elaborator. And I'm worried about, I want to make sure that this program really does prove the thing that I think it proves. You can write your own type checker. You can write a, an independent type checker that reads the Idris intermediate representation or the machine readable form and says, yes, I agree that this is well done. So you could write your own external termination checker or coverage checker. That might be a worthwhile thing for someone to do. Again, if you're looking for a project, I think that would be valuable. So QTT, so this, what we're going to see in uh, over the next couple of days is TT and QTT. So we're not going to see the Idris 2 form, we are going to see TT and QTT. Just for completeness, QTT compiles to a representation called uh, CS exp. This is an untyped lambda calculus, necessarily untyped because we've we've done the erasure step. So we, we've we've got rid of the erased arguments to functions. We've got rid of erased arguments to um, data types, um, so they, they don't get generated uh, for runtime code. Various transformations have happened. So inlining has happened. So inlining is especially important. So it's only via inlining that we can turn, I say, an I/O program into something that really is um, uh, uh, just doing the I/O operations. So, um, in fact, the, the the biggest. So this was initially in Idris One, and the, the probably the trickiest step. So I spent a weekend porting the Idris One code to something that would um, work in Idris Two, and, and the biggest step was getting the inlining good enough that um, that it actually compiled to uh, to something that ran at the same speed. Once you've done those, like I mean, inlining is, a, um, if, if, you, if you're interested in, in seeing how functional languages are compiled, compiled, you'll see that inlining is an unreasonably um, um, beneficial uh, optimization. It, it has a huge effect. Um, question: Someone, someone went ping. Question in the chat: How feasible would it be to retain some in block uh, all face types to make backend code gen easier? Interesting question. I think the things you would need to retain would be primitives in particular. So if, if you want to have unboxed primitives, that would be, uh, I think, a very useful thing to have. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I have to think about that. Um, how feasible? Um, well, on, on a scale of one to 10, uh, let's call it five. I don't know. A bit feasible. 
Um, I did, there's definitely things you can do. So some of the things that uh, GAC has to do with uh, unboxed primitives, for example, I think we could uh, we could repeat some of that. We, we we could we could just take that work that people have done uh, and apply it, and, and I think it would be highly beneficial. In fact, in the scheme back end, um, it's when 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 I've tried you know micro benchmarks. So you can't read too much into this, but I've tried micro benchmarks compa comparing um, how the scheme runs against. Um, GHC, so GHC with strictness annotations, and they're generally roughly the same. Um, sometimes Scheme wins, or sometimes Idris with Scheme wins, sometimes GHC wins. But where you really notice GHC winning is when it is able to unbox primitives. So unboxing primitives could be, for certain kinds of things, could be a really valuable thing to do. Anyway, so the CX, um, the nice thing about CX being all it is is an untyped lambda calculus. It pretty much directly maps to a scheme. So Shea scheme is a default, but also rackets. Uh, there's a there's an almost complete Gambit scheme uh, backend, um, but also a backend of your own design. So if you if you know how to compile uh, a functional language of any form, you will be able to adapt that to uh, to working with uh, Idris. So there are some other uh, other phases. So there is a lambda lifting phase. There's a translation to a normal form, but neither of those are used in Shea Scheme. There are there, there are things that you could use on your own back end if that's the thing that you want to do. So that's the overall structure. Any any part of the Idris system that uh, that you're interested in working on will pretty much um, fit inside uh, one of these phases. But we can't really cover all of that, uh, especially given that, you know, spent quite a while introducing what we're going to do using some Idris programming. We can't cover all of that. What we can cover is, um, what are we doing for time? If I talk for five more minutes, is that okay? I know it's four o'clock. I'm hoping for an answer from OHAD, how long I can talk for. It's 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 okay. Um, I, I won't go more than five more minutes. Yeah. That's yeah. And if if um, if people do uh, need to rush off now, then firstly I won't be offended, and secondly you won't miss very much. Uh, so so, but I'll only talk for five more minutes. Um, so tiny Idris, this is a this is a very cut down implementation of Idris two. It's so we're covering uh, data definitions, function definitions. We've got a little bit of implicit syntax, so so we can put underscores in for um, for implicit arguments. Um, while this is minimal, it still captures um, most of the difficulties that we need uh, we need to deal with. So, so we're not worrying about sort of source location. So, so this it doesn't have some of the things that would just be noise when trying to work out or trying to figure out how the system works. So, so, so it's just the essence of what it is to be a dependently typed language. Nevertheless, the structure of it is similar or the same as the real address too. So, if you can find your way around. Tiny Idris, you will be able to find your way around um, uh, Idris 2. It's just that Idris 2 is bigger. It's the same, but bigger. So the Tiny Idris source files, they map directly to the Idris 2 equivalents. Um, so just to show you what it looks like, what, what a Tiny Idris program looks like, and what we're, um, what we're going to achieve here. Um, so oh, um, if, you, if you go to, um, if you go to the, the SPLV, um, uh, the, the repo that I, that I put on, uh, put the link in the slides and on the Slack. Uh, you'll, you'll find that you have this available. There's two versions. Version one doesn't have unification. Version two does. So version one is a bit simpler. Um, they are complete, so I'm not expecting you to fill it in, fill in the details before you can try it out. But I will give you some details to fill in uh, separately. So um, it should build relatively quickly. It usually builds about twice as fast as this. It's just that uh, <laughs> the video is um, quite expensive. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of source files here. Um, oh, and there's a bit missing that I, I didn't bother implementing. There's quite a lot of source files here, but to be honest, the majority of that is about um, parsing, and, and I've just copied that directly from Idris. So the things that the things that you need to worry about are the ones that um, the, the core files. So anything core dot and anything uh, tt imp dot. These are the only ones you need to worry about. Uh, there's about three and a half thousand lines of code. So um, hopefully you consider that that sort of scale um, is going to be uh, relatively manageable. And what tiny address programs like? So here's a here's a very small tiny address program. There is a stage when you're when you're developing a new um, uh, functional or oh, dependently typed language 
when you get to the stage that, that you can calculate four, so when you, when you, when you can do plus suck, suck, zero, suck, suck, zero, and get S of S of S of S of zero, then you're basically on your way. As soon as you can do that, you can do all the interesting things. So this bit, th this data type definition, that is just Idris. That's, that's just directly what you write in Idris. We have to be a bit more explicit. So this is, this is something that um, Idris will work out for itself. So it'll work out that uh, Y is a variable and, I, and, I, and its type is NAT. It'll work out K. So we have to be explicit about um, uh, the pattern variables. Uh, otherwise, we write the definitions uh, just like in Idris. I heard a question again. On the, um... Um, if the person who asks uh, raise the hand wants to, okay, let this one. He asks, any thoughts on supporting conditionally support features depending on the backend? For example, shape. Oh, is this about support, um, float this, 32 this, this bits? The, uh... Yeah, that's an interesting thought too. Um, the, I, I, I've, I've wondered a bit about how to manage that. Um, because different backends will always support different things. So the, the, way, the, the way it's currently working is that you can define an external primitive and then a backend will, will compile it if it can and report an error if it can't, but that's not ideal. It would be nice to have a better way of uh, managing that. Um, so I don't know, but um, maybe, maybe you can come up with a, with a way of managing that neatly. Um, Okay, so the, uh, the tiny address called, forces you to, to be um, explicit about uh, the, the pattern variables that you're working with in a way that Idris doesn't, but we can scale up later to not have to worry about that. So a slightly bigger example, um, this was almost a VECT-free talk, but I'm afraid uh, we now finally have one. Um, uh, vectors, by the way, this uh, people always complain about vectors in dependently typed programming talks. Um, one great reason for using vectors is that everybody understands them. So, so it's a good first example because you kind of know what's going on inside. Um, this is where you start to see why it's really important to deal with unification. So, so we have to be. So, although we have implicit syntax, we can, we can leave gaps for for arguments that we're not going to fill in. We do still have to be. We'd have to like fully give the type. So, so nil has this additional argument that of its its type parameter, and cons has its type, and and the length of the tail, and then we can write a, an append function. Again, we have to be explicit about the types of the pattern variables. It's a little bit annoying, but we can we can leave implicit the um, uh, the, the, the the arguments to when, when we call a function. So this is when when we get to unification, we'll see we'll see how this implicit syntax works. Otherwise, we're, we're going to have to give um, uh, the uh, the applications in full. So we've got a, a couple of tests here, and we'll just, just to see how that works. So if you're in this test directory, you can uh, get at the uh, built version, um, and all you can do inside this this. So you know, don't don't expect um, <laughs> don't expect this sort of nice feature. Um, we can type in expressions and it will tell us it will check it it will tell what its type is tell us what its evaluation is so let's do two plus two and good so it's this is the check result this is the type and the evaluation um if we look at um well, let's do let's just do um yeah let's do cons so let's do i've, I've defined this data type um test with the, these constructors a, b, c, d. So I can say cons a onto nil. Um, and you'll see that when it type checks that, these, so this is a hint for what's coming later, these things here, these are um, meta variables standing for the result of, of type checking. So, so these, these will have solutions. What we don't do is substitute in the solutions when we do the type checking. We only substitute in the solutions when we evaluate it. So this is part of what we need to do to make um, uh, the performance any good. Um, so then it will evaluate that and you, you'll see in full um, what the result of evaluating it is. And finally, let's just try uh, appending the two vectors and you'll see um, in full what the result of uh, appending those two vectors is. So it's, um, uh, that looks weird. Uh, something doesn't look right there. I'll come back to that. Uh, all right. 
No, it's not printed something. I might have to debug something. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, so that's uh, that, that's tiny Idris. So modulo that thing that's just confused me, uh, which I'll figure out later. That's uh, that's what we're going to be um, working with. I hope that's not a bug in the type checker. That would be embarrassing. Um, so, um, so that's what we're going to be working with. That's what we're going to be working towards uh, implementing. Uh, over the next couple of days. So I think uh, that's a good point to stop for today. So we're, we're going to really dive into the code of Tiny Idris um, tomorrow. What I'd suggest you do is, as exercises in the meantime is just take a look over the code, uh, browse through uh, what each of these uh, modules are doing. So if you know a little bit about um, what, what, the, what the terms of a type theory are, you'll be able to see inside core.tt, you'll be able to see uh, a mapping from those terms to their representation. I'll work through that in more detail tomorrow. And uh, you know, don't worry too much about what's going on. Don't expect to understand it yet. Just try to get a, a picture of how the overall structure of the system works. Particularly, the particularly important bits, like the top level bits, um, we've got this um, process decal module that works through the top level declarations and adds them to the global context. In the process, it has to elaborate um, the TT imp terms into the type checked TT terms. So, um, and otherwise, oops, otherwise, um, we've got a couple of warm up exercises just to check that you're up to speed with um, with Idris programming, up to speed with with reasoning about um, <laughs> reasoning about um, associativity of list depend, for example. That's something that you that we've had to do quite a bit inside the core of Idris. So, so take a look at those exercises. I'm quite happy to answer. Uh, questions about that probably on on the slack is a good place to ask between uh, now and tomorrow um, otherwise I will stop there and if anyone wants to kind of chat informally for a bit I'm happy to do so now so thank you very much for uh, for your attention <laughs>